And welcome to another exciting episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, executives, and CEOs tell the stories that matter. Uh, my name is Paul Edwards, and I'm joined again by my co-host and partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, great to have you on the show, my friend. How are you? Happy to be here today, Paul. You know what? I think for our listeners who don't watch this show, they won't see what a significant change I have right now that I've lost a studio camera, I've lost a light, and now I'm just cobbling together some things to make it work. And the reason I bring it up, not only because I feel like I look a little bit janky right now, but uh, the reason I bring it up is because our guests that we're talking about today, are talking with today, um, it, re it reminds me that there's there are things that you can put in place that can limit, mitigate future disaster. Uh, you can also piece together new opportunities after there is some sort of significant disaster and at all times they invested. So I'm here, I'm investing in this podcast video cast today, even though all of my, all of the camera stuff I was, uh, uh, had faith in today, not functioning. And you're doing better, a better job than you give yourself credit for. But, uh, yes, we do have, uh, a, a very exciting interview today with Joey Murray. He is uh, one half of the advisory group known as wealth without wall street. And they have an eponymous book that they just released wealth without wall street. It's called it's uh, three steps to freedom through passive income. I have, I have it up here for those of you watching that is, uh, that's what it looks like. And, um. Joey's going to chat to us about a couple of different things today. One of them is going to be, um, obviously growing wealth through passive income and, uh, changing the game on, uh, the way traditionally we have organized ourselves for financial, our financial future and retirement, but also, uh, his, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about the journey he and Russ went through as co-authors of this book. So welcoming him onto the show now. Joey Murray, great to have you on the Emissary Authors Podcast, my friend. How are you? Ah, what a pleasure to be with like-minded folks and uh, grateful to be here. Grateful to have you. And um, here's where we start this, uh, but it's not where it finishes. Um, and, uh, you know, we're big believers in starting with the why. And so me and Russ have co-authored this book. You've been at this, at this game for a little while now, uh, teaching people uh, different ways to achieve the same result that previously seemed off limits for the majority of people and now much more widely available if you know how to think about it. And so that's what I want to get to at the start is, you know, you guys do all this. Now you've written a book. So why is, why is it suddenly, why a book and why now? Great question. Uh, if you have spent any time around our brand, you know that we have been in the podcast game since 2017 and you think, well, man, you guys put out a lot of content, you know, podcasts, over 500 podcasts at this point and, uh, YouTube, you know, our YouTube channel basically feeds from that. We have a lot of videos outside of that. So why what it really comes down to is that a book puts you in a different stratosphere uh, as a thought leader. It, there's just something about it. When we get uh, people that are wanting to be on our show and they have a book, it just immediately takes that interview to a new level because they've had to sit and go through the process of thinking about their craft in a way that other people haven't. And, and so for mm -hmm. That's really hard. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like sitting down to do the process of building, like writing a book was super hard because we're not super oriented to details and processes and things of that nature, but man, it allowed us to put out content in a different platform, in a different way that people, you know, consume content. And it also put us in a position, I think, to better craft our message and to be able to tell it in a way that, again, I think put us in a different stratosphere in terms of thought leadership. Mm. What would you say? Like, I'm, I'm interested to pull on this thread just a little bit here, because we've talked about that a lot with several of our clients with each other, uh, just in general, um, when you have to sit down and stop talking off the cuff 
and you lose the, maybe the face-to-face -face connection or the proximity you have with a reader, you lose the ability to project as much tonality and vibe in your voice. And you have to rely solely on the black ink on a white piece of paper, right? To get that same message across. Uh, it forces you to rethink and rethink and rethink again, uh, how you, how you say things and when you say them and conversely, when you don't say them or whether you say them at all, what was that like for you? Uh, like, I think, uh, you just summed it up very well. It was super difficult. I, you know, um, I'll use a, a term that the kids use these days, uh, the Riz, you know, like I think Russ and I, Russ and I, uh, rely on the Riz too mm -hmm. much, you know, being in, 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 speaking in big engagements or being in a mastermind or being, you know, face to face or on a podcast it has a level of where you can just kind of rely on some of that personality and, and stuff like that. But a book, it's just flat. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just how good is the message? It, and like, it has to connect with that audience in a way that they don't necessarily know your personality from day one. I think the book allows it to unfold. I mean, you can build the character as you go. Um, if you do it right, if you have the right team in place. But man, it, it is a, it's a very different modality than what we were used to. And, um, so it was a challenge, but I think it really was to, to my point earlier, a great challenge because it helped us to organize our thoughts and to become better speakers in my opinion. Yeah. One of the things we talk about with folks is that a lot, a lot of authors write how they speak. And that can lend a, a, a bit of personality, but I, I find that sometimes when we speak, we're having half the conversation in our own head, assuming that somebody else is also hearing that same conversation, which is really, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of backstory. That, did, you, did my wife call you and tell you to say something about it? Yeah. Was, well, and the, isn't it true? That's where it becomes many times most evident. Uh, and when we write a book. I think part of that process, maybe, maybe this is what you're referring to. Part of that process is uncovering all of the, uh, the things that you've taken for granted, half that backstory that now you have to actually say it in words to enlighten, uh, enlighten the reader. Now, part of that, part of that process for you, how did you go about making sure that you had said all of the things that needed to be said? I will tell you, we didn't. Uh, there's no chance that we said everything that we wanted to say. We wanted it to be a, a, a reasonable link. And so, I mean, part of the process was determining what was the most impactful or most important. And I will say this, um, we were reminded multiple times throughout the process that this is your first book. Mm. It's not your last book. It's your first book in the, the, the goal of your first book is to get it out because there's so many people, I'm sure you guys have experienced this more than anybody, but they start strong and they don't finish. Oh yeah. And it, they have a good idea or they have, but they don't finish. And so for us, I will just tell you, even over the process, it took us over three years to do this, which never should have happened, but that just, that's just the reality. And over that three years, we grew a lot, mm -hmm. even just from our own understanding of our own message. And so we look back at it near the end and we're like, there's a lot of things we would say differently at this point, not so drastically differently that we would have to remove it, but it was just like, we get it out and we can always make revisions in the second or third or whatever. So. I don't know if that helps answer your question fully, but that's how I thought about it throughout the process is cut what we can't, you know, we have to cut out a lot and we just have to get it out so that we can, we can build off of that foundation. Yeah. It uncovers for me, I think, um, the, the value of writing a book, which is the distillation of one's own ideas, what matters and what doesn't matter. And what do you really think? And uh, and the process of having to be able to communicate in the written form, as you talked about, is it's difficult, 
because it um it's less forgiving right uh, and and i think many people when they come up against this idea of writing a book they think well i don't you know i don't have anything to say but you have a lot to learn and you know i think there's the old adage that those um you don't really know something until you can teach it i think that's what book writing is all about you don't really you've not really assessed what you think until you write it down and go through it again and again and maybe that turns into a book maybe it turns into a journal entry but the process of writing is not only therapeutic but highly educational totally agree uh, and i i think that that was a kind of an unexpected benefit of this is to your point realizing that you have to go over and over and over this message to hone it and to tweak it and to make sure that it's consistent and in the order in which it should be delivered mm. um so there's so many key aspects of this that challenge us that stretched us um uh, but like i said on the other side of this came out much better and stronger well you talked mm. about how you had grown through these three years and you know arguably maybe it shouldn't have taken three years but it did I'm curious, I'm curious what other benefits have you seen that are ancillary that you were maybe unexpected having gone through the process of writing a book now? Um, I, I think we're just at the cusp of this since it's just launched, uh, but I'm already seeing people inviting us back to be on their podcast. Um, oh, oh, you have a book that just launched. We definitely need to have you back on the show. You know, that this conversation like that. Um, you know, or people that kind of, I think that we had some relative relationship with, uh, you know, kind of initially they hear now we have a book and it's just a lot more warm kind of, uh, resonance. They, they want to be kind of connected to us more. Um, those are, those are two things that I've noticed in just a very brief time that this has been launched that. I wasn't really expecting. Um, and so I think there's, there's a status element to this that is actually better than I was expecting. I'd like to riff on that for a little bit. What is it about writing a book? And maybe we can draw from our own personal experiences or, or perhaps professionally. Uh, what is it about writing a book that is an elevation of perceived status? The only way I know how to answer that is to give like the comparison. Okay. So first of all, I would say like years ago when I said, oh yeah, we have our own podcast. There was a lot of people like, oh, oh, you have a podcast. Like that was, that was a status kind of, you know, element in conversations that I would have. And, and I think that still is in today's world, that's still a pretty unique thing. Like, it's not like you go and talk to a hundred people in your city and, you know, more than one of them probably has a podcast Two, you know, maybe. Yeah. But I think writing a book is even more rare that somebody has one, a message worth writing about and two, like we have already said, the motivation and the follow through to complete it. I just think that the, it's just, uh, it's almost like, a, a bad analogy here, but like somebody who has, um, a veteran status in the army, but they have some sort of, uh, visible, you know, metal or something that they, like, there's something to sh now show that, that they've completed something. Yeah. And I just, I just feel like there's very very rarely that many people in your circle that have something like that. that that's my take on it. What's yours? Uh, similarly, uh, you know, the statistics are out there and you know, there's lies and damn lies and statistics, right? But, uh, the statistics say that, uh, over 80% of people want to write a book. And then there's the statistic that, uh, of those who actually do, um, you know, uh, the majority of them sell less than a hundred copies and close to half of them sell fewer than 25. Now, 
there's more to writing a book than simply making sales. Some people don't want to write a book and sell it. They just want to write a book for the sake of writing one for their, you know, for their children and grandchildren, whatever. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not, I'm excluding them from that category. But when we're talking about spreading a message, whatever kind of message you're trying to spread, uh, you would hope for numbers higher than that. And yet overwhelming majority, it's just tiny infinitesimal in level of impact from a numerical perspective. And so what are all those numbers telling us? They're telling us that most people never get it done. And most who do never get it off the, never get it off the ground, which means similar to what I've heard said about the occupation of sales. It, you, it, anybody can do it. Anybody can apply for a sales job. Most people cannot excel at it because of the level of, of soft and intuitive and non hard to find skill you need to succeed at it. And, and Jason likes to say, right, books don't sell themselves. People do. And a lot of people want to write a book and they just want the book to sell itself. That's not how it works. People sell the book. And so what we tell people is, you know, prepare for the lifestyle of a politician running for national office, because if you want to, if you want to make your book a success, you got to go from one engagement to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, sign autographs, shake hands, kiss babies, take pictures over and over and over and over again. And, um, let's face it. Most people, they don't want to do that. It's a good point. Yeah. And I, I think though, at the end of the day, it is, it is so worth the process. Um, and to your point, it, it's something that I feel like will become a rhythm of growth. Yep. Like as you grow, you now have more that has to pass through you. In fact, uh, one of our, one of our masterminds was meeting today earlier and we talked about what are the belief systems that you need to inherit to become the person that you want to become. And I started thinking about the heroes in my life. They were both men of deep faith and they both were very generous with their time and with their money. And, and part of the belief system was that there's an urgency to share what God has given us through us to give to others. And so I think of that as all resources, including knowledge, like including things that we've been able to learn and, you know, doing things like being on your podcast, having people on our podcast, um, networking within our masterminds and other places. I am constantly giving, gi being given a gift mm -hmm. of knowledge and, and then being able to then pass that through. Uh, I think many, many more books will come as a result of that. Yeah. So, there's an old saying that says the unexamined life is not worth living. And I, what, what, as we were speaking earlier, vision, this idea came to my mind that, that you know, I'm 46 now, uh, I have 46 years of experiences that could be mined for all sorts of information. And how often do I stop to assess? my own experiences, the threads that have held that all together, the, uh, perhaps things I need to exit from my life, the things I need to concentrate on and focus on, distill down the messages maybe that come out of that. And I, I, I really do feel like, you know, even for, even for yourself and your book, the, the process of distilling down all of the things that you could talk about in the mastermind down to the soundbite and digging into the things that really matter, you know, 20% 20, 20 of the things we do get 80% of the results, supposedly, how do we know what the 20% is if we never stop to assess it and then write it down for ourselves and what benefit could we have out of that? And then if there are other people like us, which there probably are, how could they benefit from that as well? You know, Joey, I was just thinking about the work that we've, uh, I've, I've occasionally had the privilege to do for you guys with, uh, putting together the eBooks that you have. And I think in your presentations, 
you guys probably don't set out to do it this way, but I, I just know what data points to listen for when I watch them or listen to them. But you guys always include all the data points I need, which is, you know, which is coming down to those core elements of a really good message. You're seeing where there's a problem. You're seeing where people are struggling and you're offering a solution and you're saying, this is why we need to do this solution. And then you're telling people, this is how you implement that solution. And if I have the, if I have those elements and you have them in every, every collaboration you've ever done, uh, then I can turn that into written content. It's, it's not hard to do once you know which data points to look for. I think a lot of times, uh, people are, you know, one of the, one of the difficulties of the age we live in is that there's an overwhelming amount of information coming at us every day. And, uh, a lot of us don't, don't know when to hit the pause button and block that information out. Cause you say, I can't do anything with that information. So we did, a lot of people are just passively taking it all in and pretty soon their, their system is overloaded with useless information. But, uh, when you know how to block that out and you know what you're good at and you know what to focus on and you know, you know, you've accumulated the experience that, that you and Russ have, well, then you walk into those rooms and you're very, very clear on what people need to know, why they need to know it and how they can take it and apply it. And I think that's got to play a role there too, in terms of uh, becoming a successful author is just understanding uh, at a, at a profound level, what information needs to be shared. And then the rest of it, we can get to that later if the situation calls for it. But right now we're going to focus on this. But, so let me, let me address that. First of all, amazing point. Um, second of all, we were miserable at this years ago. And we started to implement once we realized like something's just not quite right with our podcast. Um, we started to seek mentors and messages, people who have already figured out how do you craft a message? And, um, I, I'll, I'll give a shout out to, uh, building a story brand or creating a story brand, I think is mm -hmm. Donald Miller's Donald book. Miller. Yep. What an amazing, easy to follow kind of script to crafting a message. I love that. Um, secondly, we hired a mentor or a coach that came in and just his gift, Sharon Srivatsa, if you know him, oh, yeah. um, his gift is distilling difficult things down to simple, just terms or processes. He's just extremely gifted in that. So that's helped us to build framework. But I think the last point as it relates to being an author is who you hire matters. I mean, it really is, I think a make or break on being an author, either you have to have it completely clear and just hand it over to somebody to publish, or you have to hire the right team of professionals, professionals who can say borrow my experience on crafting that message and take all of those data points that you have and make it, it you know systematic and clear and i'll tell you our experience in writing the book was pretty good mm -hmm. but i actually now compare that to we did you know we used a, a sec another company to do that and since then we've worked with you on uh, doing several of our ebooks, taking some of our content and creating ebooks and the difference between the person that in the company we worked with on our actual book and then you with our ebook is night and day. Hmm. And I, I'm not trying to just like, just, but it, it really is kind of crazy. The difference because you we, we can send you just a sound bite or a an example of a, a presentation that we've done and you literally can craft it into an ebook in days that sounds better than when we presented it that to me it it shows you that there's you have to have that filter 
because a lot of authors mm -hmm. imagine are great at um, speaking, they're passionate, but they might not necessarily be super systematic. Yep. It may not be um, easy. It may not be super easy for them to like put things into an orderly fashion. And, and I just think that my experience working with you has been such that you kind of take that guesswork out and make it really sound very professional and, and very thoughtful. Well, I'm very honored. And I must say again, it, 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 I attribute it to how well organized you and Russ are because of the mentors you've worked with and because of the, the processes you've put in place for your verbal expression. Uh, you know, you could get people come along and try to relay the same information, but they're doing it at the level you were doing at it. You were doing it when it started. And then that would, that would probably take quite a bit longer. Uh, but you know, yes, uh, I am, I am fastidious about it's got to be something that a reader can absorb. It's no good if the, only the writer, the author or the messenger understands it because they already understand it. That's not the problem. The problem is everybody else doesn't understand. It. Yeah. And, and one so, of the things I'll, I'll just, it, as, as you're listening to us talk right now, one of the most simplest things that we ever learned, uh, if you're thinking about your own message is, uh, this framework of why, what, how, now. If you, if your, your message can fit into that order, people can now, they, they now have the mean to take in the message because it is a natural way that people kind of take in information. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's hard to do that. Sometimes when you think about when you're trying to present something, sometimes it's hard to come up with what's, what's the, what, what's the, how, you know, but if you really force yourself to, to fit into that framework. Um, you know, just as a, a quick takeaway from today's show that, that has helped us tremendously and, uh, it can help you as well. So in the why, what, how now let's, let's talk a little, a little bit about the business aspect of how books fit into your world. So though you've got why, what, how now as a, as a communication mechanism, how, how do I communicate, you know, whatever I need to communicate about. But you've got all all these other things going on outside of the books. So how do books fit into the uh, the business and the framework of what you do for a living? In terms of the, make sure I understand the question. You're saying how does having a book fit into our business? Yeah. How does how does having a book fit in there? How do you use books? Well, I'll I'll say this. Um, what we are doing for the world is we are retraining the way that we've all been like, I hate to say, I'll use the word brainwashed, yes. but into thinking that retirement is the answer. Conditioned. Yeah. Conditioned. However, you guys are much better with the word. Okay. I'm gonna leave that to you. But the point is it, anything that's a long form way of communication helps us to make an impact on the world because people have to it's almost like they have to indoctrinate themselves to our message because they've, they've already got something pre baked in mm -hmm. that is 180 degrees, the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so long form, like podcast and a book will help people to be able to take in our message over a longer period of time. Um, I'll say this, if you see a, you're, we, we do have some Facebook ads out there. But I'll tell you, they're largely not, not profitable because people, I don't think can make this like immediate jump from what they've already known or ex at least accepted as truth to then say, oh, well, it's actually this other way. Yeah. And, and so I think a book serves the people that we're trying to read in a way that helps them to kind of at their own pace, take this in and say, yeah, I do agree with them. They are right about that. Wait a minute. I never thought about that that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something to this. And it's just like gives them the runway to be able to make that, that literally belief system change. Yeah. There's two yeah. types of, uh, there's two types of way to, ways to approach a marketplace. One is with the 
uh, is go about finding people who already who already understand the offer. And those are relatively easy to, to convert. However, then you get in the faster, better, cheaper, um, sort of paradigm. Then there's the people you have to educate into your offer. And those two will take, take a lot of time. And many people will exit that funnel because they, you know, they're not ready for it because it is too great of a paradigm shift. So, so it sounds to me like, you know, with your podcast or educational opportunities, things that you sell, the books are a way of spending more time with the individual, uh, rather than having a short sound bite. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think the other way that it serves people is it gives people like, let's say you get on our podcast right now, we may be talking about one aspect of the, uh, we call it the GPS in the book, right? The goal plan and support. That's a whole entire process of getting from where you're at now to financial freedom. But if you listen to our podcast at any one given time, we may just be talking about the plan mm -hmm. and you've missed the whole section on goal, or we may be talking about support and you're like, well, that sounds good, but I don't know how we got there. The book really allows us to organize and summarize years of information into that one singular book in a very process oriented way that people can then go from step one, step two, step three, easy to follow. And like I said, it's almost like the cliff notes of seven years of podcasting. And, yeah. and that's, yeah. I think that's how people are served well as well. They, they want to get to the point. Whereas sometimes on a podcast, you're more entertained you know, over a long period of time, some people just want to get to the point. Let me, let me figure out if this is for me or not. And it gives it to you right straight up from the, from the get go. And, uh, and I think that that serves people as well. It's something that you hear typically or commonly in podcasts where, you know, like, Hey, if you're just joining us, if we're all catching somebody up to speed, knowing that there might be a new listener yeah. uh, and, and a great use of a book that I'm hearing from you is is catching up to speed on terminology, all of these lengthy explanations, perhaps. So when we say GPS, we don't have to say, if you're new, you know, let's just tell you what this means, but it's totally incomplete, uh, because it, it required a whole chapter or three. And, and so I think that that's a great idea for, for our viewers and listeners who are thinking about, you know, do I write a book? It doesn't necessarily have to be this earth shattering message, you know, life changing thing. It could simply be a use to catch people up to speed, give them that framework that they can then build on as they join you each week for a podcast. And, and something, I don't know if this is the way all our, all authors, you know, utilize the book as well, but one other benefit to us is that we are able to um, create a resource page specific for the book that gives you all of the resources in the order in which they're delivered in the book that, oh, I can now go get access to the investor DNA profile to take my own investor DNA. Oh, I can go in, you know, um, figure out where the, how to add uh, this mastermind to the support section of, okay, I've already done well on these first two steps, but I really don't have a, a team around me. Well, I can go from this resource page and figure out how to join a mastermind. If this is the kind of group that I want to be in, um, we have all sorts of other things, the access to the automated budget, access to the financial passport that gives you the, the goal and the vision of what financial freedom looks like all in one place versus if you, again, you're going on YouTube, you might happen across that one episode or that one video we did on the passport and then get access to that resource. But in this case, you get all of them in one place. You know, it's, I, I like what this is sort of spelling out for me, Joey, because when I was, and I, and I want, but I want to use this by way of introduction that I don't want to, we would be remiss if we didn't tell people what your book is about and give you a chance to, to talk about that too. And, um, when I was coming into, um, you know, actually doing business 
with Wealth Without Wall Street, and I was purchasing the policy that I now have uh, that has proved valuable for me in leveraging. It was such a paradigm shift that I had to I had to have Mark Haraguchi take it take me through it like five times. How am I not throwing away money here? How am I not losing money here? Wait a minute. I now I got to, you know, I, I kept getting lost around the same corner and I was like going in circles several times. And that's, and, and what that points to on a larger scale, I think is especially for people like me, when so many, when there's a, there's a, there's like a critical mass level of detail and knowledge, basic knowledge I have to have to make an intelligent decision. And if I don't have that, I'm going to choose something stupid. And so the, the teacher side of it, the mentoring side of it that goes, you know, that takes people through those progressions and then backs up and says, now, do you understand? Well, I think so. Okay. Well, let's go over it again. Right. And if you have that in a book, right, if you're, if you're reading wealth without wall street and, and you're seeing, oh, wait a minute, I'm lost. Wait, no, this is okay. Let me go. Let me back up a few chapters. I've, I know I've read this, but I've forgotten how it goes. I think that gives people just a, a, a very long time to sit with what you're trying to help them understand until they're, they feel confident and they can make a decision with it. And now, of course, you know, the, the other thing is, of course, um, being, being married to someone who's very good at managing money, uh, I have an explanation for why I do what I do, which I never had before. And so you want people to have that as well. You want them to be able to almost make their own case for following your advice. And right. that's not going to happen through 30 second sound bites or Facebook ads. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you that, um, I think there's also an element of how you engage with a brand. There's a lot of personality differences out there. Some people will hear an ad that says, Hey, jump on a free call. And they're like, you know what? Great. I'd love to talk to somebody about my question. You know, they, they mentioned this, but I wanted to know more about this and, and then, but there's a vast majority of the world, in my opinion, and it's getting more and more the, the, the younger, the generations are that they literally don't communicate other than text or, you know, some sort of an online chat or something like that. It allows you to actually take the time that you need to marinate on yeah. the whole entire process and to say, is this a brand I really want to do business with without having to worry about someone trying to follow you up on a phone call or something, which we don't do, by the way, we don't, <laughs> we're always on the yeah. receiving end. We don't make outbound calls to people. Um, but the point is, I think it gives people the time that they need to feel comfortable to move forward with the brand. And that's a really valuable sector of the world that, you know, um, you don't want to miss with your, your company. Yeah. So let's, let's round it out here, Joey. And now we want, I mean, like I said, we would be remiss if we didn't tell the audience what wealth without wall street, the book is about. And what is the, what's the, what would you say if you, you know, you've had some practice at this now summarizing, what's the book about, uh, why should people read it and you know, what can they expect to walk away? What can they expect to take away from by, by diving into it? Well, I'll tell you, um, probably the two, my two favorite parts of the book are the, the preface and the conclusion. Um, but there's a whole lot of meat in between that sandwich and the, the preface talks about our motivation for having a different way that we see the world financially. And it's largely rooted in our faith that God has given us resources to steward. Well, our book is not about becoming some Scrooge McDuck, uh, that is just just living in luxury and, and has a, a whole basement full of gold that he swims in. Mm -hmm. That is not what this world is about. That is not joy. That does not create significance, um, in any way, shape or form. What does is when we are living in light of the calling that 
God has created us to give glory to him. And so all of our resources should be used in tandem with that, that goal. What Wealth Without Wall Street is about is how do I steward what I've been given in a way that gives me the freedom to become who he's made me to be. And, and so what that is, is that's really about taking this, a difference of mindset from an accumulation method, like, you know what, I'm just going to keep putting money away and hopefully one day it's big enough that I can actually retire, which by the way, means to be taken out of service. Yeah. And we're not called to be taken out of service. So you're like, I'm not going to encourage you to retire. I am going to encourage you to take the money that you've been given and to utilize it in a way that creates passive income that will exceed your monthly expenses, because then you then choose what goes on your calendar. Yeah. Until then you're actually a slave to your calendar. Someone yeah. else is, is dictating to you what you're spending your time on and you're no longer able to get to, in my opinion, your best use for the kingdom. And so through the book, we, I, I, I give that as a backdrop to say, we're totally different than what you've always heard, right? Accumulate and retire one day. That is the opposite of what we're talking about. We're talking about being present with your family today. We're talking about using your most important resource, which is time to your benefit. And so that requires you to do three things, right? Set out a goal, which is really your vision of what that financial freedom will be, which I'll go ahead and tell you in advance. Most people have the hardest time with this step because they've shut off the creativity in their brain. And they've just said, I just have to put up with work. This is what I'm just supposed to do. And I'll just eventually not have to work whenever I get into my sixties or seventies. And I'm telling you, that is the challenge. That's not For, a good one. Yeah. yeah. Get the goal in mind. Like what would I be doing tomorrow if I had more passive income than I had monthly expenses yeah. and give yourself the, the liberty or the license to dream. Right. So that's a, that's the first step goal. The plan is where you start to, to really get your finances in order. If I have that goal in mind, now I can organize my finances in a way that supports that. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer going to be putting money. In, this is a spoiler alert. I'm no longer going to put money in a 401k or an IRA, not because they're not decent plans, but they're not good plans for somebody that wants to be financially free tomorrow. Yeah. They're for people that want to have access to cash in their 60s, but we don't have time for that if we yeah. want to be financially free in the next five years. Um, so that that's what the second section is about. Third section is about support, figuring out what sort of investor you are, figuring out who God made you to be in terms of how these different passive income sources align with who you are, and then figuring out which things are more hands-on, which things are more hands-off. And then what support system do you need around you to then get to that, that end result? So it's probably a long summary, but you get the point is that we really want to support people, um, first of all, to believe that this is possible. And then secondly, to give them a path that they can actually follow once they say, yes, that is the alternative that I've been looking for. Now, that was a great, uh, synopsis of it. Joey, if I was going to, like, we have a template that we use when we start to write a synopsis of a book, and um, I can see that the process you've been through to be able to articulate that very clearly and give people a broad overview is, is in there. I mean, you've got it. You've got a, a good grip of it, and um, it, was, it was just the right length, in my opinion, um, because, you know, had you gone, were you still talking right now? I might be starting to get a little bit might be starting to blink a little bit, you know, but, yeah. but I thought, it, I mean, I was like that, that's what, that's like for everybody just watching and listening, that's what we want an author to be able to do about their book. This is, this is why we wrote the book and this is what you can expect to find if you read it. And, uh, you know, there's, yes, there is a whole bunch of detail that goes into it. As you've heard from me, there's a lot of, um, understanding and then re-understanding and then re-re-understanding 
you got to go through to, to get to it. But at the end of the day, you know, it's like, now I have my version of what you just did. I have this, this command of certain financial situations that I face in my business that I didn't have before, because I just, I either had the cash in my bank account or I didn't. And if I didn't, I just had to sit still or, you know, start to start to slide into going out of business. And now I'm like, no, nope, I can tackle that. And I, and I don't have to sacrifice ca immediate cash flow in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And I can explain to you how I do it. And I don't have to go through an application process or get some bureaucrat to sign off on it or anything like that. I just make the call. So yeah, I love, love it. It's been great chatting with Joey Murray, one half of Wealth Without Wall Street and their eponymous book, Wealth Without Wall Street, is now available everywhere fine books are sold. Joey, what was the URL you were going to suggest we send everybody to so they can get a copy of the book and learn a little bit more about you and Russ? Yeah, just uh, a lot of times people want to connect with us, and I, I love to, to hear where you heard us talking about this stuff. Uh, if you go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash emissary, uh, we have a place to buy the book there, a place to connect with us and, um, even access to a couple of other resources. So wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash emissary and look forward to talking to you. And with that, uh, we are going to sign off for another episode of the emissary authors podcast, where we help faith driven founders, executives, and CEOs tell the stories that matter. Our guest is Joey Murray, co-author of wealth without wall street. And my co-host, Jason Todd, great to be with you both again, gentlemen. My name is Paul Edwards. We'll see you on the next episode.